for being with us. So we're, uh, we're talking about the future of wearables, but I think we can't have a conversation with the co-founder of Fitbit without kind of thinking about the beginning of wearables in a sense, and how did we get to here? 10 years, March 2007, 2007, I think, to where Fitbit is now. How has that journey been? It's, uh, it's been quite the adventure. Uh, not quite the adventure we expected. Um, just the, the whole global reach has been truly incredible. Um, you know, this is actually the third company my co-founder and I have done together. And our first, our last company was a photo sharing website. This was back in the days of uh, point and shoot cameras before cell phones, if people can remember back that far. And, um, you know, the hardest part about building this social network around photos at the time was not the social aspect, it was getting the things off the camera in the first place. And so when we first launched Fitbit, um, about 10 years ago when we were first pitching it, we said, hey, we're building a $100 activity tracker, step counter. And everyone's like, well, wait, don't I get those for free with my Happy Meal? And uh, Happy Meals have all kinds of other problems with them, so uh, don't eat Happy Meals. But uh, the, the whole idea of this connected device has been something that you know, we knew that once we could get the data, we could make it more actionable. But mm -hmm. fundamentally, if people don't wear it, and if, if we don't get the data, you can't do all those social engineering techniques to get people more active and change behavior. And uh, you know, it's been an incredible adventure you know, flying here, seeing people on international carriers wearing the Fitbits. It's just satisfying as well. Very. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned an interesting point, data. And over the next few years, I mean, so Fitbit, in a sense, I think defined the category. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, almost in a Hoover, Xerox sort of way, people said, oh, you're wearing a Fitbit. Even if it wasn't, people, people um, began to know your brand for what you were doing. Zoom over the next 10 years, mm -hmm. and you mentioned data. How likely is it that data will become almost the key focus of Fitbit over the next decade in what you're trying to achieve? Well, actually, I think data has actually been our key focus from the beginning. At the beginning, it was like, how do we get the data in the first place? Which is why, you know, ultimately, we put a lot of energy up front to make these things very beautiful. Because ultimately, if people don't wear it, like we've got, you know, different devices, you know, everything from our latest Higgs, which is really large, uh, it's kind of more of a smartwatch to kind of very thin trackers and with heart rate. Yes, different people of different fashion. Like, you know, you and I dress differently. My wife dresses even more differently than either of the two of us. And so being able to, you know, customize it is really important. Because again, if you don't wear it, you don't get the data. Um, I think we are now at the point where we have, um, you know, 90 billion hours of activity data. 5.4 billion uh, nights of sleep. Like, if you add this up and turn into years, human history or humans only came on the scene 7 million years ago. So this goes back 20 million years, if you were to kind of line it all up. And so you start seeing really interesting insights to that. And that's in some ways, so again with Higgs, we recently announced um, you know, the ability to do um, apnea detection and AFib, um, kind of AFib detection, mm. so kind of heart irregularities. Mm. And part of the reason we did that is we started seeing these trends in the data and we started seeing like, hey, we can start seeing things about our users, we should tell them about it. And um, you know, actually help them become healthy rather than helping th having them have it discovered on their own. And I think that's where the really big change is going to be, how do we help people? So we've already rolled out coaching, but what's the next step beyond that? Okay, and the next step beyond that, do you think um, this, th this data, an enormous amount of data that you have, incredibly useful, the potential for insights and actionable insights, undoubtedly there, do you need the participation of medical professionals? Do you need clinics and doctors to be a part of the Fitbit future to make that data more actionable? You, you definitely do, and I think for two reasons. So first of all, just the whole research. So for example, on AFib, we're working with um, you know, Fitstar Georgetown. So Georgetown is one of the major research universities in the US, mm -hmm. and kind of, you know, they've got access to the, the patients and also a lot of the science. And we've got science as well, um, but you know, just working with people who run clinical studies, so that's really important. But also fundamentally, you know, if you look at Western medicine, it's all about, you know, it's very focused on the doctor. And um, the doctor is somebody who is highly trained, but very expensive to train, and thus very, very expensive to deploy in the field. And you think about your doctor's visit, you go in, you spend 15 minutes with them once a year, if that, and they, you know, they, they spend a lot of time with their back to you, typing in data. And, you know, I, I think what's really interesting about, you know, Fitbit and other wearables 
is the ability to first of all ambiently collect data. But it's not necessarily all going to go to the doctor. And if you think about it, you know, the first part of changing people's health is the individual. We all change our health. Then the next step is our family. Then there is kind of the coaching layer. Then there's nurses. Then there's doctors. Mm -hmm. And doctors are very good at dealing with acute things. Like, you're going to die right now? Doctor's the right person mm -hmm. to go to. But they're not necessarily great at dealing with massive data feeds. And, they're not necessarily, and that's not what they're trained for, and that's not what we should be paying them for. And so the trick is, how do we have, you know, the, whether it be the AR, the Fitbit, mm -hmm. or kind of various pieces up that chain of social engagement to say, hey, you know, I've noticed you're, you know, something's wrong. Let me take care of you. And kind of figure out the right step in that chain to kind of jump in and do the intervention. That's what the, I think the real future is. Is it feasible that a Fitbit subscription from my doctor is part of my future? Yeah, so I could totally see a time frame, you know, and again, I don't think, this, we're, not, I don't think we're talking about, you know, the year, you know, yeah. the year 2020, the year 2050. This is, this is like right, um, right around the corner. Like you can imagine, um, so knee surgery, really common surgery, um, orthopedic surgery, really hard to recover from. Um, and in fact, there's two aspects of this. So when someone goes for knee surgery, people do the right exercises and are able to recover quickly. They're, they're fine, they're good for a very long time. People who are not adapting, they tend to get back to the hospital and actually the cost of treatment is more expensive on the return than on the initial thing because it's a complications. And so, and that's both the cost of society, like we all pay for healthcare. Mm. And you know, ultimately it's a cost on the individual because they're suffering bad health. And so you can imagine getting to the point of time where the doctor rather than giving you, when you have your knee surgery, a mimeographed piece of paper, photocopied piece of paper that says, here's some exercises. And then you have an expensive nurse calling up to say, did you do those exercises that are coming to your home? You can imagine the doctor gives you, I'm going to pick Fitbit products because, well, that's what we sure. do. Um, but you can imagine the doctor gives you Fitbit coaching, which is basically starts you off on an easy set of exercises, figures out when, how you're doing. You try and tell it you're in pain or not. It checks your heart rate. It dynamically adjusts the coaching. And as you go, it kind of keeps going and takes you stepping. Um, but if you're not doing this, then humans get involved. You know, then the nurse calls you and says, hey, you're, you're, Mr. Smith, you're having trouble. How can I help you? Mm -hmm. And that ultimately then reduces the chance you go to the back of the hospital, which means it's more likely to be successful, saves the, the system money, but also saves you your health. So uh, it seems that if we all wore Fitbit or another de you know, devices... Um, no, we should all wear Fitbits. Uh, well, oh, okay, I thought you might, you might agree with me. Um, the potential to lower the burden on health services. In Europe, we have disparate services in Portugal and France, for instance, very good health services. In Western Europe and Ireland and the UK, not as efficient. Um, surely there's an opportunity for Fitbit to work with health services, so we just leave the doctor behind. And what about the whole health service? Because your data, your actionable data for the analysis of even clinical outcomes must be invaluable to entire health systems. Yeah, so we actually, um, in the U.S., we're already working with the health system. So UHC is one of the largest insurers in the U.S. And they have a program um, called the Motion Program, where they will give you a tracker, um, Fitbit, and, um, and basically if you meet certain metrics, um, an amount of exercise, a duration of exercise, and a frequency, like you have to spread throughout the day, um, they'll give you $5 a day every day for a year. So that's $1,500. Imagine an insured couple, so that's $3,000. That's actually a sizable percentage of a family's net income. Mm. Um, and so, and you know, I know these people. They're very nice people, but they're not doing this to be nice. Mm. They've done the actuarial math mm. to say, if I can incentivize you to move more, ultimately in the US, people move insurers every three to five years. So ultimately, they're gonna have to spend less money as an insurer, which first of all, again, returns value to the, the user because they're being healthier. Um, but it also returns value to society because we're spending less money. So that's something we're already doing. But there's other things around, you know, diabetes. You look at a lot of the chronic diseases, which have long-term impacts on, you know, whether it be diabetes, heart disease, um, you know, various types of mental illness. Motion is a great way of treating those. Like we're giant bags of chemicals, and you know, these are the biggest muscle groups in the entire body, which really drive a lot of the chemical reactions. And so motion, like you know. There have already been studies that show you can reduce and decrease diabetes just through activity. Mm -hmm. um, and you can actually kind of reduce the cost of drugs you're on, so that saves money. Um, but it also just makes you healthier. 
Uh, as you mentioned, diabetes, um, which is a crisis illness in Europe, as is obesity. I think Western Europe, 26% of children in Ireland, certainly, uh, are now clinically obese. Um, the potential for wearable tech over the next five or ten years. I don't think technology as an industry can sidestep some blame because if we give people the tools for a sedentary yeah. lifestyle, well, they're going to have a sedentary lifestyle and do a lot of this. So over the next five years, maybe not fixing or solving, but what about helping with the obesity and di diabetes uh, illness uh, in general? How, do, how, does, how does Fitbit fit into that, um, even starting with kids? What right. about good habits? And even if it's gamification, where do we start? So, you know, I think kids are very unique just because, you know, I, I've got two young kids at home. Protecting their privacy and data is yep. really important. And so that's something we are solely going to be easing into, but we're not there yet. Okay. Just because making sure we've got the right controls. Like, you know, there's things that I might want to do socially that I don't want to do for my kids, and that's really important. But, you know, there's things like we, reminders to move, which we have, which we, a feature we rolled out on, on Fitbits a while ago. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if people in the audience are from Spain, probably the, one of the most active countries in Western Europe. Um, people from the UK, uh, not so much. Um, now, by being one of the most active countries in the US, uh, or sorry, in, in Europe, um, that means about six and a half hours of sedentary time versus eight and a half hours of sedentary time. So um, they say sitting, which uh, maybe we should be standing right now, <laughs> um, is a new smoking. Yeah. And um, so we rolled out this feature called Reminders to Move. So it basically pings you to say, hey, you, know, you haven't moved in an hour. Here's, here's, a, here's a recommendation to move. And we looked at users before we rolled out that feature. And then we rolled out the feature, and we saw them starting to move more. What was really exciting is not the fact that they started moving more when we reminded them. It's the fact that after time, they actually needed fewer and fewer reminders, which means they were innately changing their behavior. They were no longer dependent on us, which ultimately to me is the goal. Like the goal is to make sure that you know, we have done a great job, the less impact we have on a day-to-day -day basis. And that to me is just really satisfying. You, met, you met, made an interesting point about data and, uh, and, and privacy and kids. Over the next uh, few years, and you mentioned a, a few minutes ago about insurers working with, with Fitbit and other, other manufacturers. Do you think it's equitable over time that um, if you move more than me, that you pay less for your, say, your health insurance? Do you think that that's the way the market, in a way, might use your technology to deliver commercial benefit for them, even though ultimately, perhaps encouraging us all to be fitter and healthier? So, you know, I think that that's definitely one way that we, we try and we want to really want to run an, um, an ethical business. Mm. I would actually say that more than that, um, just because, yes, if you move more, you're likely to cost less. Yeah. But really, the expensive people, the goal of the industry is actually to drive the expensive people to less expensive people. So I would actually argue that they're more likely to want to give, find the most expensive people to give the technology to. Because, you know, if you can drive someone from a $10,000 a year diabetes drug to a $3,000 a year diabetes drug, they're still on a drug. That $7,000 cost saving is huge. And that mean, and, but you can do that. So for example, you know, if you don't sleep well, you are less, like the diabetes drug is less likely to be effective. Well, we can detect REM sleep. We can detect apnea. Oh, you've got an apnea. Well, how about let's give you a, um, you know, an eight, uh, um, you know a, a forced air machine to kind of help you breathe better. Well, that makes a drug more effective, which means they've got to spend less money on further treatments. Oh. Driving the cost down whilst Driving the cost helping down, with the health. Which ultimately, all society bears those costs. Okay. Over the next couple of years, uh, as a company, do you think um, the data inputs that you'll get right now, um, um, hard activity, um, what about straps as the new apps almost for, yeah. you know, for uh, skin or sweat analysis and, and deriving information uh, from that? Are we likely to see that starting to become part of our personal sort of holistic health picture? Yeah, so, and, you know, that, that's part of the reason, you know, some of the stuff's going to be built by Fitbit, and part of the reason we have a nice new open SDK is to allow people to write apps to use the sensors for things with, that we haven't even thought of. With the new Ionic, with that's the, when you know yes. yes. So okay. with the new Ionic, we, on the new Fit, version of Fitbit OS, you can actually build your own things using the sensors. And so some of the stuff we're going to build, and some of the stuff you can imagine healthcare systems or individuals building to kind of drive healthcare improvement. Well, that sounds incredibly powerful, though, and, and the potential for partners to be part of that. Um, uh, oh, oh, 
The actionable data, which I always find very, very, very interesting to read about, um, people, people being saved almost, and you hear these stories, is that true? Have you come across people who say, you know, Fitbit, re it made me call my doctor, my doctor called me, I did something that helped me uh, out of trouble? So in the early days of Fitbit, we got, you know, hey, you know, I lost weight, I, you know, was fighting diabetes, you know, it got me to walk more, it got me more fit, you know. We had one woman who she, you know, was about 70 years old and she got her Fitbit and she walked 2,000 steps, she's got a badge. She's like, that's cool. 3,000 steps, got a badge. 5,000 steps, 10,000 steps, 20,000 steps. She walked 20,000 steps every day for six months just for the badges. Ah. Um, but then as we rolled out the Pure Pulse, when we first started working on that, everyone said, hey, you know, I can do a chest strap for running. Why do I care about all day heart rate? And it turns out if you don't know it about yourself, you don't care. Mm. And, um, you know, we now get emails on a daily basis. Um, you know, there's one that stood out where this woman was, actually I think it was a guy who was driving home from work one day and um, he, you know, looked down his Fitbit, he was feeling lightheaded, looked down his Fitbit, said 140 beats per minute. Drove for a little longer, said 150 beats per minute and was still feeling nauseous, so drove to the hospital. And doctor said, an hour later you would have been dead. Mm. Um, but he discovered this on his own. Like, yes, mm. we helped. Mm. And I think then the future is, how can Fitbit be more proactive? And we're mm. not necessarily going to diagnose. Mm. We're going to say, go to see a doctor, which is, again, collaborating with us. Or husband. even, as we said a few minutes ago, maybe the doctor is part of the picture. And the, the doctor gets the page, the beep, right. or whatever, and, and delivers the notification. Is there anything, I mean, it's obvious that Fitbit is changing from being, you know, five years ago, we all thought of a fitness tracker, a fitness business. It seems your emphasis, and even you use the word health more and more, Fitbit is really becoming a health-centric uh, or focused company. So I think you know, health means different things for different people. Um, you know, when I was uh, 15, health meant uh, was I running uh, you know, a 5K race in 18 minutes versus 15 minutes versus 13 minutes. Um, you know, at 40, health is starting to mean something different. Mm. And to my father at 70, health means something even mm. more different. Um, so, you know, if you look at a plane, thousands of sensors on a plane. If you look at a car, hundreds of sensors on a car. The human body is actually a lot more complex than either of those. Mm. There's no sensors on it. We don't know when something's going on. And so, you know, that, that's something where I think that we can, we can play a role. And with mental health, Fitbit's role in mental health over the next, uh, say, few years? So, um, you know, I think there's all kinds of different ways that we can play a role. So there's studies that show if you ask someone every day, do something you're grateful for, they're actually much more likely to be happy as a result. You don't actually, like, nothing's changed in their life, but they are reflecting on what they have to be grateful for, and they think about it. Well, that's a simple app on an Ionic. Mm. Are you happy? What are you happy about? You can do that, which then drives things. So that's kind of one aspect. You can also figure out by doing surveys, you can figure out when someone's mental health is changing. Deteriorating mental health actually correlates a lot. Like, you see people's gait change, you see people's activity level change. Well, we can detect that there. What helps with mental health? Well, actually, the kind of driving, the, again, that giant chemistry set, you know, it's kind of a vicious cycle when you're going downhill, but you can actually, it's the same cycle that works going up the hill. So if you're moving the, again, major muscle groups, it's a set of endorphins that are drives, set of adrenaline mm. that drives, which then drives more positivity, more, and resets the system. And so you can both be a preventive, a detection, and a cure. And a good note to end. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a great 10 years for Fitbit. We're looking forward to the next 10. Eric Friedman, co-founder of Fitbit. Thank you. Thanks.